Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Elevate Your Equity podcast. I'm Derek Clifford. And I'm Sophie Lauren Clifford. And we have another exciting episode for you today. We have an awesome guest here. Uh, It is Mercy and Hendra, and they are uh, successful real estate investors who invest together. Coming as a foreign student to the United States, Mercy and Hendra earned their degrees from San Francisco State University. And after graduation, Hendra has worked on IPO startups, Fortune 50, and Big Four corporations, while Mercy worked in the hospitality industry and successfully operated multiple restaurants as an entrepreneur. After investing in single families on the side to save for their son's college fund, they realized that that just wasn't scalable and it wasn't fast enough. So it prompted Hendra and Mercy to start to look into multifamily together by late 2018. And then they finally decided to make the jump into multifamily investing in mid-2019, just a year and a half ago. To date, Hendra and Mercy have been involved in five projects with more than 9,900 units as both general and limited partners. And Hendra and Mercy also lead the San Francisco chapter of Multifamily and More, a networking group of like-minded multifamily investors. Besides doing investing in multifamily as a family, Hendra and Mercy love to connect and help others who are just trying to get into multifamily investing and get started. We had an awesome conversation as usual. It was great. They did not disappoint one bit. And we talked about a lot of stuff, didn't we? Absolutely. One of the things that stood out to me the most that we haven't really heard much of, or maybe it doesn't come up often, often, is the fact that they are able to incorporate and integrate their child into their ventures. And what's really, really amazing is that their son, their 13 year old son has been watching them and has been learning the ropes along with them inadvertently. And I think that's for young couples or for couples who have young children, it's, this is going to be a great podcast to start listening for ways to incorporate your family and just be able to overall elevate every aspect of your life so that it doesn't have to be compartmentalized. Fantastic. I love it. It's it's such a great interview. So you guys are going to be uh, very excited to listen to that part of the show. But we also talk to about all the units that they control and strategy and acquisition and how they work together as a couple to take down some of these properties, where they're looking to buy, how they underwrite, and just the general philosophy that you need to take if you're going to be investing in multifamily real estate. Absolutely. And as you're listening to it, you'll pick up on the great synergy that they have as a couple and how they really utilize each other's strengths to support one another, just from underwriting to overall vision and execution. So I think this is going to be a wonderful, amazing podcast for just listeners out there who are maybe struggling to juggle and balance everything. This is one of those podcasts that you're going to have to take some notes. Absolutely. So we've talked about it a lot. Let's just bring the guests on. So let's do it. All right. And we have Hendra and Mercy with us. Thank you guys so much for joining us. We are excited that you're here. And first, what we want to do is we want to start with a little bit about you guys. So can you explain who you guys are, what you guys do right now, and how you've gotten to where you are? Sure. Well, thank you, Derek and Sophie, for having us here today. My name is Hendra Tambunan. I'm still a W2 job. I uh, have a W2 job. I'm a, you know, I work as a technology consultant. Started with real estate about 10 years ago. Been acquiring mostly single family home. Have a portfolio of about 10, eight to 10 properties at one point. And we start realizing that it's not scalable enough that at about almost two years ago, our, our passive income has been transitioning becoming our college fund for our 12-year-old son, 10-year-old son back then. And I told Mercy, like, look, this is not scalable enough. Then we need to start transitioning into multifamily. That's where we are today. And I'll let Mercy introduce herself before I took over all everything. (laughs) Hi, my name is Mercy, and I joined Hendra as a full-time real estate professional starting last year, June, I believe. So before that, we are kind of, I'm in transitioning, looking for a business and been looking, 
Now that when Hendra mentioned about how can we speed up, um, and so our student, Jeremiah student loan will be taken care of while we don't have to sacrifice our retirement plan money, then it will just uh, put me on the hot seat and okay, I think this, this is, this is it. This is, I think this is a business. Yeah. So I'm excited and learn a lot and still learning and so looking forward, uh, knowing what's <laughs> ahead. Excellent. Well, thank you guys for taking the time to introduce yourself. Let's back up a little bit. Let's talk about when you guys first got started, right? How did that conversation happen when you first sat down with each other and said, we need to explore real estate? Was it more of like a gradual thing or were you working a W-2 and you kind of had this thing on the side or you had a family members that did this maybe? Can you go into that a little bit and then how you guys started to talk together and work together on it? We really want to hear more about that. Well, for me, I mean, real estate is a numbered thing, right? What you got to basically... Uh, a rental income and then you got a mortgage expenses and then add to everything cash flow, then it's a good thing. No, but when I would start looking into multifamily, things a little bit shifting, right? Mercy at that time already embarking into doing like a, an e-commerce business on the side and decided like, you know what, this is not for me. The e-commerce, I want to start looking for like a brick and mortar businesses. And I was looking into venturing into multifamily, reading a book, and I said, like, this is actually like a business itself. And then this is this is something that's scalable enough, but you got to treat it like a business because you cannot treat it like a single family investing. You can just buy and pray. This is what I tell uh-huh. people, like buy and pray, and hopefully things are going well, you know. Uh, but the things like you have to treat like a business, how do you increase your profit margin while serving your best customer, which is your residence? And as I was looking into it, I said, like, there's a, an aha moment for me is like, Mercy, I think you need to take a look at this because this is a business that you've been wanting to get, come to, but don't know where to start. And we can treat it like a business. And first of all, obviously, she, she's always mentioning that I'm not, not a number person, but she's actually, she's the best, better underwriter than I am right now. I mean, knowing <laughs> what she is. I, I give her the book that I read. It's a Will Barrow Profit book by Jake and Gino. I was like, why don't you take a look at it, read it. And tell me what do you think? To my surprise, she read it cover to cover on the weekend, which has never happened before. Anything that real estate book, she never got interested. And then um, the following week, she told me, like, I mean, I I didn't I didn't follow up with, with her. By the way, she's the one that being proactive and telling me, like, you know what? I like this model. Let's do it. And I told her, like, look, if you want to do it, then I need your help because I, me as a W two employee. I can never do it myself and then make it scalable. And it's someone, my spouse, especially that I can trust that we want to team up and do it together. I mean, that, that's from my perspective. That's how we start. And then Mercy, you can have more color commentator. See, the, the things that, the book that really uh, speak to me is uh, Gino was a chef and I'm coming from a restaurant business as well. So I operate a restaurant. So I kind of understand because he keep put. Um, the example in his restaurant. So it just really resonated me very well. And when he's talking about how we can improve in the community. So there is the aspect of human touch on this business. So it's not just real estate, the building, construction, the number, but there's a human size really intrigued me. Oh, this is something that I would love to explore. Very nice. So let me so let me let me see if I can understand this. So um, when you guys got started, you always have been business minded. It sounds like, right? And when you got into this, do you guys have any single family experience at all, or you guys jumped right into multifamily? No, we do. We do have single family. Uh, we got about eight or ten properties single family. Got it. Got it. Okay. So you guys, you guys saw that there was um, some power in real estate, but you wanted to scale up. And I really love how you guys said, Hey, you know, let's, let's work together on this. There wasn't one individual person that said, I'm going to read this. I'm just going to start spending time on this and not even think about the other person in the relationship. Cause you'd be surprised how often that does happen. And there, there can be a tendency for that to occur a lot in marriages. So that's fantastic. Did you guys ever have, like going back a step further, when you started investing in single families, did you guys have a joint vision that you guys uh, kind of worked on together? Or how did you guys start investing in single families from the first place? Well, 
she always give me a blessing to do the single family as long as I'm not losing money, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> like, like, right? But, um, Very like, wise. You know, Yes. Yeah, but yeah, obviously, I mean, she's trusting me to do it, right? Obviously, there's always going to be a time like, hey, you know, there's a problem or, or turn out that we have to fix something. It happens, right? She understands. She's very forgiving on that sense, by the way. But obviously, she just basically allowed me to do it. And then sometimes, as good as it sounds, we just actually, I feel a little bit more pressure. Obviously, yeah. trying to preserve, right, the trust that she gave it to me to begin with. But that sometimes things happen, and then it, it's actually it doesn't affect our relationship, but it just adding more pressure to me as a husband because hey, you, my wife trusting me, you know, all the saving and thing like that to invest, and I better do it really well, right? So now when we shifting it as a team, it, it's not me trying to share the burden to her, but I just saying like, hey, you know, this is something that's scalable enough, but. We got to treat it like a business. It's not just like investing, buying and praying and hoping that things work out really well, but we can work out a team. You coming in from the entrepreneurial background in the hospitality industry, I'm coming from the tech industry. Let's team up together as a one unit, right? As a family and we can, we can scale it up together, work together. And that works really, really well. I mean, I've seen people that exactly when the family team up together in a multifamily, they leap, you know, tenfold or hundredfold sometimes just because there's the synergy that worked really well. Um, that's why yeah. we saw it. That's great. Yeah. And um, I love how you both talked about, you know, it, it sounds like you reframed the whole aspect of real estate, instead of looking at it as like, oh my goodness, this is a whole new venture that we're going to have to start from square one. It sounds like you both really took some inventory of your skills and your experience and your background. And then we're able to just say, hey, this is like you said, I, I love what you said, Henry, this is just another business. And then uh, Mercy, bringing in all of your skills and and just being, like you said, synergizing together. Now I'm curious too, you know, throughout that whole process, what I want to kind of understand what were, how did it overall strengthen your relationship and where did it create some tension? Oh, (laughs) the one that is really uh, created the tension in the beginning, because this is everything is new for me. I think the learning style. So Hendra is kind of person he can walk and he can uh, uh, mention to me, can you imagine this? Can you imagine? No, I cannot imagine. It's not, <laughs> <laughs> I cannot imagine that. I need you to, to draw it for me. So that from that point, I am mentioned to Hendra, this is the way I learn. So I am more visual person, more kinetic. So he need literally have to draw it to me. This is the circle and it's going here. So I love reading your book there. It's amazing. Oh, thank you. Thank um, you so I'm, much. First thing first, I'm looking at all the charts, the picture, because that's how I learn better. <laughs> thank you. Um, so the learning style that it's kind of uh, first separate us and then now it's strengthen us because I literally mentioned to Hendra and also the communication style. And I mentioned to Hendra, Hendra, I'm not a abstract person. The way I think is more linear. So, and if you talk to me or communicate to me, can you let me know what is bullet number one, bullet number two? Bullet number two? Yeah. And that's how I kind of perceive things easier for me. So I think the learning and the communication, how we interact, that is first separated us. And then once we know the style is kind of more helping us together to strengthen our communication style. Yeah. So if, if I can add more also on that one, it's actually uh, sort of like make creating more friction, even though it sounds like in the beginning it's a friction, but it's actually make us uh, strengthening our relationship better because now with them, we understand how do we communicate, right? Because I'm more... Mm-hmm. Coming from a person like a visionary, I got a lot of ideas like what if, what if, what if, mm-hmm. right? Instead of now, I got to be very selective in communicating at my what if. Um, so pick the one that is more concrete and explain it to her in a way, in a visual way, like, hey, we can do this and do that. Another election, that's going to be plan B. Instead of like from, from plan A to plan Z, throwing it up to the wall, now I got to be let it that sink in, 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 in my brain and then selecting which is the top two or three for her to, to digest. Mm. 
beautiful. So it sounds like you guys have struck a balance where you guys know each other's perspectives. And mm -hmm. would you guys say that that's given you an extra advantage? Because now instead of just looking at a particular investment or a particular problem or issue or situation, instead of having one person, now you've got two minds looking at it from a different angle. Would you say that that's helped you in the past? It, it does because yeah. many times that we've got a deals coming on our, our desk right now, she usually just looking into it. She provides like, oh, this is our approach. This is our process. And she took a look at it and it's like, and then I'm the one that balance, try to balance it out. Like, you know, try to challenge that. What if this is the scenario that we pull? Does it really make sense still? Does it really make sense? Because she's, she have like a framework, like, you know, what is it in the flood zone? Which is how's the, the area and, and so forth. Behind the napkin underwriting looks good or, or bad. And then I'm the one that's trying to balance it out. But if it's good, how about have you look at it from a different angle, right? That's how kind of we, we team up together we, before we present it to our larger team, our partnership. Great. Love that. I think that's a, that's a true power couple right there. You guys are awesome. That's, that's amazing. Um, one more question before I let Sophie ask whatever it is. I know she's burning to ask a question too. Uh, I wanted to ask you guys, you know, you have a son also who's kind of watching all of this happen. Mm -hmm. Do you guys see that there's any kind of this starting to rub off or what kind of things do you think that he's learning? Or is, is there anything there that maybe our listeners can take away from all the things that you guys are doing, all this hustle that you guys are bringing and how it's affecting your family? For us, our son is actually really interested in real estate because we try to educate him. And I think the beginning of this year or maybe late last year, he, he wanted to buy his shoes, uh, van shoes, this was skateboard shoes. We, we told him like, look, we're going to buy it for you, but with one stipulation, I want you to rate the, reach that for that for teens. He was like 11 years old, and, you know, uh -huh. and then because he's motivated, because we incentivize him, he was really willing to read it over the weekend too, by the way, from <laughs> cover to cover, which has <laughs> never happened before. <laughs> and then I, I, I test him too. Like we, we tested him. So what, what, what is your takeaway from the book? He's talking about asset and liability. What is asset? Asset is something that put money in your pocket, liability is something that you know, put money in your pocket. And then get him interested about real estate because he thinks that real estate is, is an asset because he got the concept of passive income from the book. Uh, one of our proudest moments as a parent that when his teacher was teaching the whole class, it's like, oh, if you want to get wealthy, you buy Amazon stock. And then he said to me, like, I think that's a lie. It's like, why do you think it's a lie? Because you have no control over your money. Mm -hmm. you, let, you basically give it to somebody else to control that for you. Then what is the best way? I think he said, like, he literally said, like, the best way is buy real estate because you have control of everything in there and you can get generate wealth from there. Wow. Incredible. Incredible. That's so yeah. great. And that's coming out of his own brain to you. That's, that's amazing, you guys. You should be so proud. Yeah. 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 yeah actually, oh, go ahead. So I, I also uh, um, kind of remind him many, many times if you cannot hold the principle and there's a possibility that you will lose it, it's speculation. Unless if you can hold the principle, then it's an investment. So every time you want to get something, it's like, okay, oh, mom, I can, this shoes, it will depreciate a lot. Yeah, so what is that? Oh, that's a, yeah, it's a look. <laughs> so, so he got it, yeah. Wow, that's so inspiring. Actually, actually, that was the question that I wanted to ask because oh. how um, do you start to, help your children understand because we're, we're planning on starting a family soon too. And we were just, it's, it's interesting to see couples again, so like power couples and having so much on your plate, but then having to balance that out with the family as well. And I'm curious too, what other ways do you find balance when you, when you, when you're juggling so many things at once? I would say that no, the limit too, because Working together, sometimes you can robbing off your kids in a different way mm -hmm. because you're passionate about real estate, you're, you're passionate about the wind, but sometimes you forget that your role as a parent too. And the Mercy is very gracious to remind me all the time, like, hey, there's a limit. When you go out, you know, you want to inspire them, but at the same time, you don't want to turn them off just because you talk about it all the time. 
Mm-hmm. So try to strike a balance, something that just could be very difficult, but at the same time, you have to constantly be mindful that they are your kids too. They are not really your apprentice. I mean, they, they are apprentice, but they're also your kid. They need your guidance and your love more than your um, coaching to you know, build wealth all the time. So mm-hmm. but we, we try to balance it out. When the moment that he, well, I mean, he is a teenager now, he's t- just turned 13. So the moment that he's literally st- it's that thing, quiet, we know that that's just a hint that we need to stop what we're talking about. Real estate or business and start becoming a family again. Such a great tip. Thank you so much for sharing that because my question was going to be, how do you know when to switch hats? Yeah. And that's, that's a fantastic answer. Thank you for that. I like also to show him, hey, let's eat, um, you know, he's a teenager. He has a, a kind of appetite right now. And he loves steak. And then uh, once in a while, was, oh, you know, let's go to Alexander. So we ate in a good restaurant. And then we remind him, okay, so do you know that this is the fruit from, from our investment, from our distribution? And he's like, oh, this is pretty nice. Yeah, we can splurge. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Can you imagine if we have a... Uh, uh, many, uh, you know, uh, properties and we get all the distribution and mommy and daddy doesn't have to work anymore, just managing those. And he start getting it. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Wow, <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Wow. Did you want to follow anything up, sweetheart? No, that was great. I, I love that we, we were able to understand how you work with your son as well. And I'm curious, what if he does in the future decide, oh, I, I really want to do this full time with you, mom and dad? And I want to, you know, what, how would you go about that? How would you go about integrating him into the family business later on? Well, we always open though. And he knows that he wanted to do real estate. I mean, after that reached that poor dad, he's actually uh, did a little bit side hustle because I, he, he actually told me that, Hey, I want to invest with you. And I, I give him a certain amount, like, which obviously is a five figure. And it's like, if you get this small amount, then I'll, I'll let you invest in one of my deals. My, I can talk with my partners and then we'll figure out something. It's like, oh, wow, that's, I mean, given like, you know, he was like 11, 12 years old, like that's way too much for me. I don't even have to saving that much, you know, with all my Christmas money and my birthday money. I don't even have that much. You know? <laughs> like, uh, yeah. And then, and then we kind of like about the side hustle. Like we, we play with him a, a cash flow one, a, a game, you know, cash flow 101 a couple of times. We do talk about the, our uh, leveraging people experience, people money, and also doing the side hustles. So he's actually doing a little bit of a uh, side hustle of selling shoes right now. I got a, a few deals. I mean, to our surprise though, given that he always have a trouble waking up in the morning, but he's willing to wake up at six o'clock in the morning on Saturday, just waiting for the shoe drop. That's very encouraging. <laughs> um, yeah, but he is he, he waiting for his shoes, like Adidas Yeezy. And then he actually borrowed our money, you know, to buy two shoes and then he flip it you know, make a, you know, uh, a few hundred dollars from there, but that's how we're doing a side hustle. Because the intention is he want to invest in real estate deals. We have to constantly remind him just teenager being a teenager, like remember about the goal that you want to do, because sometimes the money you don't have before, now you have it mm-hmm. and things start like, oh, maybe I can buy things that, yeah, I'm going to a little bit, right? Mm-hmm. Just like mommy and daddy, no, remember your goal. You have to mm-hmm. constantly remind them of that. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, I I think this is going to be great for our listeners because probably so busy in in what they're doing right now, listening to this, listening to what you both are saying, this is probably going to help them understand how to bring their children in or how to communicate with their children about overall like values and goals. Thank you. This is wonderful. We always remember, remind, remind our why, right? I mean, we create a generational wealth but we also don't want to lose the next generation, which is our son in this case here. Because mm-hmm. many times that we get into business, to multifamily, but we forgot the reason why we're doing this. And we don't want to definitely we don't want to lose our next generation or our son or even our grandson, right, to experience this. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah, I think a lot of people make that mistake where they focus or dedicate their lives to real estate investing, but then they forget that they have a life. <laughs> uh, and I made that mistake also. And Sophie helped correct me back onto the path of why are we doing this? And so I think asking that question all the time is great, but that's why we are so into bringing in as many people that are willing to work with you on this so that there is a relationship there. There is something there that you can talk about and you can pursue 
growth together, right? So it's not like you're shutting anyone out or trying to like hide in your cave like men tend to do, right? And yep. just work on it. And then then you start getting conflicts of interest and time and, and resources. And, you know, if you're spending all the weekends, not with your family, but just underwriting deals and mm-hmm. trying to find property, talking to brokers on the weekend, that just isn't sustainable. So that's why we're big, big proponents of people working with their spouses and their family to get something going, no matter what it is, start creating some sort of passive income. So thank you very much for that. Mm -hmm. Now I want to move on a little bit and I want to, uh, I want to talk about what you guys have going on because you guys live out here in the San Francisco Bay area. You guys are out in the East Bay. And Mm -hmm. I think what's very cool is that I remember seeing your son there a few times at some of your meetups. Let's talk about what you guys have going on right now. I know on your website, it lists the portfolio that you guys have, um, which is very impressive. But can you guys talk a little bit about what your real estate investment portfolio looks like right now and what you're looking for and how you're working together for that? Yeah, for us right now, we do have my, our main portfolio has been in, in Dallas. We added about one more LP position in, in Dallas, but that's about it. Since then, since I think since summer this year, we start branching up to Kansas. We got a, a couple of deals that we're working on right now. Obviously, Mercy's have been helpful. Like what you said earlier before, like I've been juggling many different stuff with W2. There, I mean, there are m- multiple times. These are my saving grace, to be honest, though, because there's a time that I feel so overwhelmed. We literally, the way we put our office, we're sitting next to each other. And she just turned around to me, how can I help you today? Right. They kind of think that's really helpful because there are many times that I feel stressed and, and overwhelmed. And then she just turned around, hey, let me take care of that for you. Like finding a insurance broker or, or vendors or, or following up with the brokers, with seller. I mean, that's been pretty hectic for me, but she's been very helpful and then step in and helping along the way. So we got like two deals in Kansas right now that we're working on. It's much smaller than we normally did in the past, but we really truly enjoy because this is our first project going to be in Kansas. Looking forward for many, many more. Yeah. Excellent. So how did you guys break into this new market? And first of all, how did you guys um, start growing in the markets that you selected? Did you get plugged into a network? Walk us through some of that, how you got started in the multifamily business from the point of view of having some single family experience. We are part of a community. We are a member of, both of us are a member of Will Bear Profit, which is a chicken Gino community. That's how we typically find our partner through our networking over there. Uh, we, we spoke with a lot of people and, and obviously from their chemistry, and we feel like we truly enjoy working with these people. And then we start branching out. And our criteria in entering a market, typically we're looking for having a people that can be a boots on the ground that know the market well. We almost never come into market where there's no people that live over there. So that's how we usually started into getting to the market, any market. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Got it. Okay. Fantastic. So you start with boots on the ground and the internal network. And mm-hmm. maybe to back that up, how did you get into the network as well? Because there's probably many people that are listening that want to find out more about how they can start just like you guys did. Yeah. If you want to reach out, to me, um, you know, I, I'm available to Facebook or my website, Hendra Tambunan. Um, I'll be more happy to introduce you to Josh Rusen, who is the community director with Jake and Gino. They always open up for our conversation. No string attached. There's no sales pressure or anything like that. Just connected. And it also, there's a lot of different networking group. You know, Mercy and I are hosting San Francisco Multifamily and more. Mm-hmm. It's a networking community too. Even though it's labeled San Francisco uh, multifamily more, we're not really necessarily looking for San Francisco market. We just like a localized multifamily and more family, which is a nationwide brand uh, that we focus on the San Francisco Bay Area chapter where people can connect it. We do have a lot of sister chapter coast to coast. And then actually that's not true anymore because we have a Honolulu chapter too now. So where people have any interest, like in Cleveland, Chattanooga, or, or Florida, or any other market, we do have a, a connection over there that we'll, I'll be more happy to connect people and helping people to get in the, maybe knowing the broker over there or boots on the ground on that market. 
Excellent. Well, we, said, uh, the, we, we know we'll barrel profits from bigger pockets, right? That's how you. That, that's another uh, one yeah. too. Also, we have another yeah. bigger pockets. Yeah. yeah. You can connect. Very, very so, good. Okay. Yeah. I think, I think we had reached, we had connected at, at your meetup a few times and then COVID hit. So we weren't able to continue that, unfortunately, but I was looking forward to meeting you guys again in person. Once I mentioned what markets I was looking in, you guys just stepped in right away and said, oh, here, there's someone you should meet who's investing in Indiana. Please connect. Mm -hmm. So really, really appreciate everything that you do to try to connect people, no matter what experience level they're at. So I definitely encourage our listeners to reach out to you guys and then also go on to your Facebook group uh, and then your guys' website. There's plenty of ways to get a hold of you guys as well. But we'll get into that a little bit later on. I want I still have some more questions for you. Uh, but I will take a minute to pause right here and see if Sophie has any questions that she wants to ask right now. I'm good. Okay. So let me, let me ask you guys, um, what was of all the things that you guys have done from going from single family to multifamily right now, what was in your mind, the best property or the best transaction that you guys have done? Oh, that is so different in its property. Mm -hmm. I would say my, my personal favorite is actually one of the deal in Dallas. It's it's about 104 units. I'm mm -hmm. we are coming in as an LP position over there, but the it's in the suburb of Dallas too, and the property is actually was supposedly going to renovation the insight, and so we can upgrade it, but the property was so hot in the market that when we even when we visit the market over there the occupancy is almost like never below 95 percent and any any plan for us that we do for internal upgrade it never materialized to today and it, it just cash flowing 12 percent on an annual basis so yeah i mean for us i'm really happy and then you know we, we use our qrp money for that one so i've been it doesn't go to us, but it's, hey, at least my QRP is <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's always a good thing. Yeah. Well, so I, I wanted to ask you too, before uh, we jump back into mindset, what are you guys looking for these days? I know for me, I've been constantly underwriting and looking for properties, but cap rates are so compressed. Um, and for the listeners out there, that means that properties are just very expensive. So for every dollar of cash flow that you're looking to acquire, the purchase price is very high. That's what that means. And so it's very competitive because a lot of people out there are understanding that multifamily in this economy with COVID and everything, real estate is at a premium because interest rates are low. People are moving everywhere. They're moving to markets that are a little bit cheaper. And so real estate is definitely the star in this economy, whatever it is right now that we're in. So what, how are you guys approaching your acquisition strategy? Are you guys wanting to continue that more suburban areas outside of metro areas? Uh, can, can you walk me through a little bit more of your, your acquisition strategy and where you're looking to acquire? So we are more like a focusing more for workforce housing. So we're not really interested into like an A-class asset which right. would be for B and C, most likely a C plus B minus with a good, very good location, right? People, where people can raise family and feel secure and safe. Typically what we're looking for, is just some, some upside there. We gotta approach it like a problem solver, right? What is the problem they're having? What is What can we do about it? And that's typically how we approach things. Could be a management issue, looking for what we call value add, things that we can improve, that we can, increase the rent but a lot of people come up with approach like oh how, how much money that we can raise yeah that's that given eventually right but to try to think about think about your the property you acquire as your product and you, the residents actually your customer how can you serve them better better or at least above average to bit the surrounding area right maybe you paint them a little well you know a little bit and then you put them some little exterior touch. Mercy usually pretty good about it compared to mine, given her mm -hmm. experience. And then inside, maybe you give a double a two-tone paint color and paint the, the door and the cabinets. And it's a small little thing like that. And it makes people like enjoy living over there. And only by then, you're going to be rewarded with the rent upside from there. Excellent. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's 100%, 100% right on. Now, Mercy, um, when you guys bought this particular one, this 104 units in the suburbs of Dallas, 
how did you guys work together on this one? Um, I wanted to get more into the details of like, which one of you guys did what um, from the beginning to end, from going from underwriting it and talking to brokers all the way to stabilizing it and now making distributions to your investors. So that is limited partner. So we Uh pretty much, yeah, we we receive the investment summary and then we kind of analyze it all together. And we speak more on the uh, asset manager so that's a little bit more like both of us reading the investment summary. Yeah. yeah but for the Kansas one, so normally I will I will be the uh, the first underwriter for the team, and then once I get something very lucrative, I think I'm looking more so on the upside. The pricing could be anything, but if there's no upside, I'm not interested. And especially a lot of uh, uh, property kind of in the flat zone in Kansas area. So we have to be careful, no flat zone, um, there's an upside. That's something that I'm focusing. Then I will mention to all the team, hey, this is interesting, check this out. And then we have put on the ground. And also to answer your question, our acquisition strategy is, is very important to have a put on the ground. If not, that's one of the way that we receive good deal. I mean, good investment, you know, a lot of opportunity from there because we have no idea what's happening in Kansas, but, yeah. you know, we have our partner. He knows, you know, it's like here, there's a San Lorenzo in the East Bay, not just San Leandro and here, but there's San Lorenzo. There's still opportunity there, mm-hmm. you know, the pocket area. Absolutely. Yep. Targeted acquisition. I love that. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, Sophie, did you have anything you want to ask about acquisition or anything else there? So um, it sounds like you guys have developed a really good model for and criteria about what you like and don't like. And so in Mercy, it goes through you first, first pass, and then it, it goes to the rest of your LPs. Now, what does it take for all of you to agree? Well, well we have a meeting. We have a meeting, yeah, obviously. Meet. And, uh, and even though our criteria might be the same, but in some of the way we underwrite it, it's going to be a little bit different, right? We, we tend to be more conservative. We we also have a partner to, to be a little bit more aggressive. So that's where we, we open up for our discussion, right? Uh, we mm-hmm. try to have a healthy conversation, like why I like this one, why I don't like this one. And then that's how we, we agree, right? We agree or disagree how to move forward or not, right? I mean, that's the, that's the beauty of a partnership. Even though within us, there's a partnership, there's also a larger partnership that we work as a team mm-hmm. try to understand each other like, hey, which model that worked or not, right? And then again, reiterating about the importance of having boots on the ground is really helpful because that's, sometimes like, the number looks pretty good, but that could be on the edge of the very sketchy area that's something that you don't want to even yeah. touch, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, we've seen a property that literally just like, looks very good, very lucrative. But the moment we look at a crime zone, it's just like all over the place. It's just like a crime, like it's pretty much like a crime crime to be have to happen, right? Because it's surrounding area, things like that. Or it could be the next block could be very sketchy. Something that we don't even know. Mm-hmm. So it sounds like there has to be an inherent trust between everyone and especially, and also um, it's really nice to have all the different perspectives. <laughs> Yeah, I would say that underwriting, and maybe you would agree with, with this, uh, with me, Mercy, is that underwriting is very much an art form. It's a science, but it's very much an art because, you know, in looking at over ten dozen properties, right, me over the last over the last year, you can make any number look fantastic on paper, right? You can make anything look good on paper. And remember, when you're buying from real estate investors, which are, you know, usually owners of apartment buildings are usually other investors. They're not people like homeowners, like what you could do with the single family home, right? Mm -hmm. They're more sophisticated because they're setting the price for as much as they can get, but Mm -hmm. also try to reflect reality, usually in that case. And so that's one of the reasons why we're seeing the pricing moving up. But it's really important to be very, very, very conservative right now in the economy that we're in with your underwriting, but also treat it like an art form to find creative solutions, right? Maybe there's a solution that not even the seller is aware of that you could implement, go in and implement. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's where a lot of the value is. And I think underwriting is key. and, and, And I'm glad that you guys all work together as like aristocracy to try to figure that out. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I mean, the, what you just said is really true, Derek, because we, we live in California, right? Anything outside California is always cheap. 
But yeah, again, the right. number doesn't make any sense. I mean, for us, seeing like a, an increase of hundred to hundred dollar is pretty common in the Bay Area, but not outside there. And then we put that kind of hat thinking in our underwriting in Midwest or, or Texas, that doesn't fly mm-hmm. out, right? I mean, hey, it's two hundred dollar in the market. Great. First first year, increase it to hundred. The next year, hundred hundred. <laughs> Boom. Year two, we hit performer right away. Like, oh, sorry, it doesn't work out that way. Yeah, exactly. Right? So we got we to gotta think. That's reason, again, having local uh, boots on the ground, you understand the, the market, the people over there. What is the trend? What is the, mm-hmm. the rent growth over there? That, it makes sense, reasonable. Because great, you hit the performer, but nobody renting. So what's it good for? <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, the vacancy and then also the market rents that the brokers love putting in their very nice, shiny looking offering memorandum, right? And I've seen a lot of uh, investors who are starting out underwrite market rents is something that they're going to get right away without any type of like stabilization period at all. Fortunately, they have lots and lots of capital behind them. And then they don't end up going further than that first deal because everything falls apart and their investors start losing faith. So I think that being really, really conservative on the underwriting, but also creative enough to understand what's realistic and can be achieved given market conditions with growth. I think that that's what you guys are doing beautifully right now. I think that's what we need to all look for, but it's, it's tough. It's very hard to do that properly because it takes a lot of minds to look at one situation to make sure you're not missing anything. Because if you are missing something that could be detrimental and Just one real quick story on that. We found, me and one of my partners found a property in Cincinnati that was a small 24 unit. And Mm -hmm. the numbers looked fantastic on it. It was rehabbed already. It looked great. And we almost got to the point where it was under contract, except, you know, Vinny Chopra is one of our mentors that we work with, right? Another Mm -hmm. student in the mastermind group that we're in asked, he said, I wonder if there's any section eight there. Yeah, I wonder if there's any section eight tenants in there. And it turns out that the broker was not wanting to answer that question and doing some more research and pulling in another property manager to take a look at this property before we get on a contract. They're like, oh yeah, that's all section eight. That's why the market rents are so high. Mm-hmm. And the, even though it looks like the neighborhood is, is easy on Google maps to so just drive around and everything looks clean, the crime is terrible there and it's moving in that direction. So mm-hmm. really this investor or the seller was just trying to dump it and trying to put lipstick on a pig and find mm-hmm. someone like us in California mm-hmm. who doesn't have proper boots on the ground or a team to just pay an exorbitant amount of money for that type of property. And so it's just, you got to be super careful because they're very sophisticated, these sellers, and you just have to make sure that whenever you're buying a property, if a deal is too good to be true, then it's too good to be true. There's always a reason. Yep. Mm-hmm. Trust and yeah. verify. Yep. Yep. Trust, but verify. I love it. Especially now. Especially now. <laughs> <laughs> if you guys had to do it all over again, where do you wish, or what do you wish that you knew when you were starting out in investing in real estate, even from the single family side, when your, uh, your son was very young? I would say that I'll jump to multifamily right away yep. <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> and find a community that, you know, you can plug in. Our mantra has been the ABC of multifamily, always be connecting. Any partnership, any deals, it's all goes to go, come from connecting with people, whether connecting with community, uh, learning from each other, and grow together from there. I mean, this is purely a team sport. So far, I really enjoy connecting with people and learning from each other. Yeah, and that really speaks true. Because I know that you guys love connecting each other and you guys have such generous, warm hearts to want to give and teach people. And that's really what people need to be looking for, especially for people that are offering properties for limited partnership. I think that's really important to be a good steward of that and not only be a good steward of people's money because they're putting it behind you, but also be a good steward of their education, teach them the right way. Excellent. Excellent. Well, that's fantastic, you guys. Um, I wanted to see if Sophie had another question um, because what I'd like to do is move on to the rapid round here. We have five quick questions that we ask every guest that we want to get into at the end. Uh, But I want to let Sophie have the last word. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'm I'm curious what your, both your vision, what your shared vision is for the future. Great question. (laughs) (laughs) Or have you had time to think about it? (laughs) Well, we do, we do. We yeah. do. I mean, but it's progressive. It's a progressive, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So for us, 
intentionally, uh, we want to start it because of a college fund for our, our son to begin with. Now we want to also try to sponsor uh, other underprivileged kids. You know, we, both of us are, was born and grew up in, in Indonesia. We work in the, with the NGO called Wool Harvest that allowed us sponsoring kids in Indonesia. Uh, we, our goal is to, we sponsor a, a few of them already right now, but we, we want to expand that kind of sponsorship for kids that are underprivileged, not just only our son, but also back in Indonesia, our grassroots over there, so the kids can go to school without feeling the pressure and burden of having to work or, or forcing their, their parents to work a lot harder for them to go to, you know, just even for graduate from high school. Mm -hmm. so that's our intention. Wow, that's so inspirational, guys. I love that there's this beautiful, bigger why behind everything you're doing. That's the driving force. So thank you so much for sharing. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So let's go ahead and get into it. We're in the rapid round right now. And the first question is, number one, what book has had the biggest impact on you and why? I would say it, discover, Now Discover Your String by Marcus mm. Buckingham. Yeah, I have that one up right up here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, one thing that resonated to me is like a lot of people are trying to be, be someone they're not born to begin with, but in each one of us, God already give you a, a, a strength that you need to just, if you perfecting your strength and then bring your weaknesses to the average, then you're going to be the best person of you, who you are from that book. And I actually inspired by, because of Marcus Buckingham book for that reason. The book that inspired me is Limitless by Jim Quick. Mm. That's, uh, he titled himself as a brain coach. That is because I thought I am not a number person, but actually it's just a wrong perception. And I learn more on my learning style. And num the, the second book is uh, The Catalyst by Jonah Berger. Mm, I haven't heard of that one. Yeah, that's an amazing book. Mm. Catalyst and uh, what is the blue book that you're reading? Uh, Contagious. Contagious. Yeah. Contagious. Yeah. Contagious. Yeah. By Jonah Berger. That is it's all about mindset how to um, minimize the barrier because we also doing a few capital racer. So it's, it's important as well. Excellent. Yeah. I'm going to be reading those. They're, they're going to get added to my, uh, to my bookshelf reading list. So okay. thank you very much for that. Appreciate that. All right. Number two, if people wanted to be just like you guys, what is the first actionable thing that they could do to follow in your footsteps? I would say, don't be like me. Be be yourself first. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, in, all, in all seriousness, right? You know, it begin with with, with what with, with you, right? A lot of people like we was we were asked like, oh, should we just come into multifamily as a couple racer? But for me, for us, like, look what's behind you in your backyard. Because at the end of the day, if you have more deals than affluent people in your backyard, then use it for your advantage because there are many different ways you can come in. There's so many value you can bring in to the table. Even, even your skills, right? A lot of people neglect that to realize like people like, I don't know anything about real estate, but you're a project manager. Hey, you know, a syndicator is actually a lot of do project a lot of program management, management project management. Um, so if you have a skill set, you're it. You, you can be a, a good managing a project to begin with. If you're accountant, good in accounting, we need a lot of people that help with the accounting numbers because of the crunching numbers again. Looking underneath, especially when you do like a financial audit, look in the T12, you want to look in underneath the line, right? In between, be able to read between the lines. What is it that they're trying to hide from the buyer for us, right? A lot of people, they don't have to be like somebody else Find your path in a way, in the most unique way, even though your goal is the same, but look at what's in your pocket to begin with and use it for your advantage to help the team to grow together. Absolutely. 100%. That, that ties back to the answer for your first book, for your first answer, which was find out what your strengths are. And then when you do that, can you imagine the team that you can assemble when you've got everyone who is a master at their craft, right? That's how the best the best real estate performers work. They bring in people that are more skilled than them in other areas and, and just bring, you know, bring it all together. So I love that answer. Thank you guys. That's fantastic. All right. Number three, what do most people not know about you guys? 
Is there any interesting or uh, quirky facts that you guys may want to share with our audience so they remember you guys? All right. What is it? Quirky, quirky, quirky. things. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, for me, um, not a lot of people know. I'm actually, uh, I have a color deficiency. So I was sort of like a color blind. So every time like, I, I look at something, even like we just painting our, our house internally, I got to rely on Mercy. She's just, again, my secret. Like, hey, <laughs> yeah. you pick the color, I'll, I'll trust you. Sometimes I have people it's like, hey, this is red. Like, yeah, I don't know. I'll put the Mercy to validate that. <laughs> for me. That's good. But so far, at least it doesn't impact my analysis of numbers so far. I mean, this is a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, that's, that's another re- good reason why Mercy should work on the underwriting spreadsheets because they'll know when the numbers flip from red to green, right? <laughs> that's very important. There you go, yeah. I can see the negative sign though still. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Okay, number four. How do you like to unwind and restore your creative juices? I would say just relaxation being given that the last eight, nine months we've been working from home. Yeah, it's just like, you know, I just random things. Sometimes for me, even going to grocery stores at night, that's already <laughs> relieved my stress. There's a lot of impulse, like, hey, I, I literally the last few months I've been asking myself, like, do we need anything? We just <laughs> pick it out. Like, yeah. Target or, or Safeway or, or Walmart just for the sake of it, you know? <laughs> That's really funny. You know, we uh, just for for the sake, it's just really ironic because yesterday Sophie and I did our first Instacart transaction. <laughs> and uh, that was, it's just really funny the timing because Sophie's actually, she was saying, what did you say? You said, I actually feel guilty. Like maybe we should next time, let's just go to the store because this yeah, is. Yeah, I felt so bad. I was like, oh my gosh, we could totally do this. I should be the one doing Instacart shopping for other people because, you know, I, I sat there just feeling so bad. And then when they finally delivered it, I was like, oh my gosh, I don't think I could keep doing this. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty awesome. <laughs> I love to um uh, to run, you know, when um for for a long for a long day, just to release it out, just just running because we used to uh, run a health marathon. That's how we got this kind of mindset in the business. Uh, long run, especially on the running and everything. I have to run a lot. <laughs> yeah, just. <laughs> I get it. Yeah. De-stressing. That's awesome. That's great. Yeah. yeah, That's a good, a good thing for sure. Exercise is always great. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right. And then the last question is, is there something special that you, both of you guys like to do together? We enjoy travel much. I mean, in the, in my previous employment, I traveled quite a lot. We got also a, a few times opportunity to travel internationally for work. And obviously, when we, we traveled internationally before as, as a family for vacation, but when we, we find out that the more we travel as a family together, both of us with our son, it just really uh, becoming an enjoyable moment. And we truly enjoy that. And this is one of the, our bucket lists eventually that when we allow to go full time, that we're going to travel more as a family and embark and enjoying and learn about different culture too the destination of everyone. Yeah. yeah. And also the food, right, Indra? That, that, that's <laughs> yeah. It's always coming to food. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. We love to explore different kind of food um, ingredients. Um, I think that is, and, and we love to tie it up with their culture. That's why we, you know, food travel and blend it nicely. That's so great. You guys are the same from our hearts too. We, we, love, to, we love to eat and experience that culture too. It's really great. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you guys, you know, so much for being on here. We had a blast and we covered a lot of ground. There's a lot of stuff that we talked through. We talked passion and vision and then legacy, bringing in your children and family. And we talked about acquisition criteria and tips to get started. So thank you guys so much for the wealth of knowledge that you guys have, have given us. Now, how can our listeners find out more about you guys? I'm going to give you the open floor here to say that's what, what's going on in your world and how people can learn more about you guys and work with you. Well, they can stay connected with us going to our uh, website, www.ideaboxcapital.com, I-D-E-A-B-O-X, capital.com. There's a contact list form, and you can also reach out to us through Facebook, Hendra Tambunan and Mercy Helen Tambunan. Love to connect with people and help in any way we can. 
We also have a newsletter. Feel free to reach out to us and we'll be more happy to include us, uh, include the listener into our newsletter to see what's what happening with us and then learning about multifamily at the same time as well. Absolutely. And also uh, from me personally, if you want to learn underwriting, reach out to me. I will, there's one person kind of reach out to me, Mercy, let me teach you how to underwrite it uh, from our accountability partners. Uh, in the community and I want to do the same also because it's like an eye-opening it's not as hard as everybody thought so if anybody wants to learn and get a a little bit pointer reach out to me and I'll be happy to show it to you excellent will do I'm sure there's gonna be plenty people taking you up on that there you go yeah (laughs) (laughs) excellent All right. Sophie, do you want to add anything before we sign off here? No, I've learned so much from the two of you. So thank you for really giving us a peek behind the curtain and sharing your journey and your lives with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having us. Thank thank you guys for coming on board. We had a blast and we will be talking to you soon. Take care. All right. right. Thank you. All right.